Solar energy is the most abundant energy resource on Earth. And solar panels are the most popular method of collecting solar energy. And did you know that in 2022, the United States alone generated 145.6 terawatt hours of solar power? And for the last 18 years, solar energy has been the fastest growing source of electricity. So what do we do with all of this electricity? To keep pace with advancements in solar energy, we need to further innovate in our energy storage systems as well. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Passive components will play an important role in the next generation of solar and energy storage systems. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Prasad Parachuri from OnSemi and Walter Fusto from Worth Electronic and I explore trends, challenges, and solutions in solar and energy storage systems. We also examine EMI considerations for energy storage systems, the benefits that battery management systems brings to these kinds of designs, and how passive components can make all the difference in solar and energy storage systems. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic. Hi, Walter. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. How are you? I'm great. And hi, Prasad. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. So, Prasad, we are talking about next generation energy storage systems today. But before we dig into the solutions in this arena, can you give us an upper level view of these kind of designs? Yes. Energy storage is becoming predominantly important in various segments of the end applications, starting from residential storage at homes and then commercial buildings, also adding the storage nowadays, and also the utilities for high power level, they are also adding the storage. The storage can be segmented into two ways based on power level and also the whether it is a AC coupled or DC coupled. Coming to the power level, single phase solutions are starting with from 4 kilowatt to 7 kilowatt and going to the higher level from 12 to 15 kilowatt for residential applications. In the US, it may have a split phase and uh, in Europe, maybe a single phase residential applications. While for commercial applications, the power level is in the range of 100 kilowatts to 2 megawatts but they may have a power blocks in the range of 15 kilowatts to 150 kilowatts, and they parallel multiple of those uh, higher power modules to get into the two megawatts power range. Then there's a third is related to the utility scale, and those are mostly the three phase and can go to the power level five megawatts and above with a power building blocks of 150 kilowatts to 300 kilowatts. And one of the major reasons for these storage systems end customers are adding for load shifting in case of utility application and as a backup power, either residential or commercial applications, and also the peak power support. For example, in EV charging applications where you have multiple cars are coming at the same time for charging stations, there's a lot of burden on the utility. The energy storage at the charging stations help you to take the peak power support. So... Prasad, what kind of trends are you seeing in the solar and storage arenas? There are two different segments based on the power level and also the isolation required, whether it is AC coupled or DC coupled. And then when coming to the power level, we have different power level for different application segments like residential applications, commercial application and utility scale. For residential application, the power levels are in the range of 4 to 7 kilowatts for the low-end applications and then from 12 to 15 kilowatts for a little bit high-end systems. Then for the commercial applications, we will have like a 100 kilowatts to 2 megawatts and with a power building blocks of 15 kilowatts to 150 kilowatts. Then similarly, utility systems, there is a three-phase systems can be as high as 5 megawatt systems but with building blocks of 225 kilowatts to 350 kilowatt. The DC bus used to be 1100 volts for the utility systems, and now they are moving to the 1500 volts, and that necessitates the two kilovolts power modules. 
Customers normally use discrete components like TO 247 package or in some cases, D square pack, toll package, like a medium voltage pets in general, they are using the toll packages. And for micro inverter applications, also the customers using the toll package. Then there's a new package for the higher power inverters, like at seven to 15 kilowatts we talked about. There may be a possibility of mix of discrete or a power modules. In case of the discrete, there's a new package called the b pack, which is a top cool package they are customers preferring. And in case of commercial and utilities, mostly they are using power modules like Q1 and Q2 modules for the inverter and storage applications. Then also there is a new module called Easy F5 module with a base plate. And this is more popular nowadays for the high voltage applications like 1500 volts bus application with 2kV die. So, Walter, what passive components are used in solar applications? So, the use of silicon carbide modules allows to work with higher switching frequencies. So, when it comes to the boost converter, the magnetic component that shows the best trade-off between cost and performance is a flat wire inductor. Also, we want our solar inverters to be as reliable as possible to avoid frequent maintenance, and this is why it is advised to use film capacitors instead of electrolytic ones. Finally, from the block diagram shown in this slide, we can see that the use of storage system comes with a higher operating voltage. It is critical to isolate the control circuits for the gate drivers and for battery management with dedicated transformers. So overall, these are the trends for passive components that we can mention. That makes sense. So, Walter, let's talk about the market size of solar and storage systems. Right. So, the residential and solar photovoltaic inverter market was valued at 5.2 billion US dollars in 2022, and it is projected to grow at 11.3% CAGR from 2023 to 2032. Driving this growth include several factors. Among these, we can name, for example, the increasing global energy demand, a significant investments in rooftop solar deployment, and also a favorable business environment. If you want to look more on the product level, we can see a difference between string inverters and microinverter technologies. And string inverters are gaining popularity due to their cost effectiveness compared to microinverters. What is more, string inverters allow individual connections with a single solar module, where then thus resulting in lower failure rates and obviously cost benefits. What we can add is that regulatory concerns about the effective interconnection of grid type solar installation can also further enhance the deployment of potential for string inverters. And one last thing that we can add is that efforts towards energy efficiency and conservation will also boost the adoption of energy storage system in residential premises. So Prasad, can you give me some details on an inverter for these kind of bi-directional systems? Yes. So we normally have in the residential inverter applications, there are different topologies customers normally use. And one of the topology normally they use is a H-bridge. That means they have a one hop bridge doing the high frequency switching. And then there is an EMI filter and go to as a line. And then the second hop bridge is basically create a neutral. And this is very popular topology. The main advantages of it have fewer parts, but it have a little bit bigger inductor and maybe a lower efficiency and THD is okay but the design is very simple and uh, straightforward. In US, they may use a split phase solution. Then you may have additional hop bridge in addition to the single line. Then to improve the performance of efficiency and better THD, heric topology is one of the popular technology. And that slightly more complex control, but it added two more additional switches and that may be having a higher cost, but the output inductor is smaller and then efficiency is higher and it have a better THD. Then the third one, we also have a lot of customers are nowadays using, which is a H6.5 inverter topology. And this have two additional FETs plus one diode clamping diode is also needed, but it have a lower switch stress. It is a higher cost because of the more switches, but it also have a smaller inductor, a efficiency and better THD. That is one of the reason on semi developed a, a custom module to add all these power switches into a single module that simplify the design. 
on semi also have a elite sick power simulator and both h bridge and h6.5 can be simulated in elite power simulator so walter can you talk to me about emc for energy storage systems a bit as well of course so from an emc perspective the photovoltaic system includes various subsystems components and also auxiliary devices we can focus on some key elements from an emc point of view which would be the photovoltaic cells, of course, inverters, battery controllers, and cables. So I will start with saying that evaluating EMI in photovoltaic generation system is a complex topic because it requires analyzing an equivalent circuit with elements from both the AC and DC sides to identify the sources of interference. EMC regarding the DC side largely depends on two factors. First of all, the capacitance of the photovoltaic generator system, and secondly, the inductance of the DC lines. So grounding the PV panel frames is crucial because it impacts both EMC and safety. Furthermore, shielding the DC lines can significantly reduce electromagnetic fields, but this is effective only if the shield is grounded on both ends with a high quality connection to earth. Then we can add the shielded and well-grounded DC lines of also offer optimal lightning protection, which is always good. And the length of the DC cables affects not only the distributed transversal capacitance, but also the longitudinal inductance. So this inductance forms what is called a resonant circuit, potentially causing the PV system to act as an unintended antenna. So we don't want that. The values of the equivalent circuits, resistor and capacitor depend on the cell parameters, while the inductance is primarily depending by the cell connection geometry. So we, there is this difference between the two equivalent circuit parameters. If we want to talk about the impedance of these components, this varies with factors such as cell voltage, solar irradiation, temperature, and also frequency. So this re reconnects to the fact that it's a complex topic that takes into consideration several aspects of the system itself. If we move on to a more schematic level, depending on the power level and amount of attenuation needed for differential and common mode noise, there are different filter configurations. So in most cases, a two-stage line filter is used for the single phase inputs. So this single phase is good for up to around 7.4 kilowatt. Anything above this power level is usually designed for a three-phase system. So the two-stage filter that is shown refers to the use of two common mode chokes together with the respective X and Y caps. The X cap across the L lines provide differential mode noise reduction by forming an LC filter with the leakage inductors of the common mode choke itself. So we don't need another component to create this LC filter. It's done directly with the common mode choke. Wurt Electronic provides with our selection tool, Red Expert, the possibility to select a common mode choke not only based on the common mode inductance, but also on the leakage inductance, so that customers can really select a common mode choke that complies to both differential and common mode noise reduction. For lower power levels, moving to a three-phase system, as the current is in three live lines, the noise is also equally distributed among these three lines. Therefore, a single stage filter is usually enough, as we can see in the bottom figure on the left, especially for passing limits in industrial environments. But the higher we go in power and the use of these charging stations in home installations, more stringent limits of the class B need to be attained. So in this case, when we move up above 25 kilowatt, we cannot avoid of having a two-stage filters. So we need a two-stage filter for common mode noise attenuation and additional LC filter for differential noise filtering on the bottom right. Finally, we can see a graph that illustrates the conducted EMI noise behavior from a battery power supply under condition of 24 DC voltage input and 127 AC voltage output. The noise level exceeded standard limits in frequency bands from 150 kHz to 5 MHz, with some peaks staying below limits in the 5 MHz to 16 MHz and 24 MHz to 26 MHz ranges. But it is absolutely obvious that an EMC filter is needed. And what we can also provide is some guidelines to consider to minimize interference. It's good to place the PV inverter far from interference-sensitive appliances 
it's good to install appropriate EMC filter on the AC side of the PV inverter, which should be positioned close to the inverter to minimize the connected cable length, which can radiate disturbances. Basically, the cable behaves as an antenna. We should keep cables between the PV inverter filter and PV generator system well separated from AC main supply cables, and cables between PV panel and PV inverter should be twisted pairs, grounding the shield to avoid contamination. Finally, we should also use an electrically shielded metal wiring cabinet for both the inverter and the filter, and we should provide low impedance EMC ground, which is distinct from the safety ground, to protect against electrocution while reducing the EMI. Okay, so Prasad, what about the converter? What does that look like? Yes, based on the power level of the storage systems, we may implement different power converters. And also it depends upon what is the voltage of the battery, whether it is the battery voltage is lower than the panel voltage or it is higher than the panel voltage. If the output battery voltage is lower than the panel voltage, normally we use uh, synchronous buck converters. So that means you are able to use MPPT function and then take the maximum power point uh, tracking of the solar panel and then charge the batteries using a synchronous buck converter. While in a similar way, if the panel voltage is lower, and for example, if the panel voltage is 24 volts and the battery voltage is 48 volts, then we need to use synchronous boost converter. That means you are boosting the power level from the panel, lower panel voltage to the higher battery voltage. The battery voltages are depending on different customers. It can be 48 volts or maybe 96 volts. And in the residential systems, some customers want to have the panel voltage low or higher but the, having the battery voltage 48 volts, for example, the panel voltage can be 24 volts to 96 volts. In this condition, the customers try to combine the both synchronous buck and boost into you, what we call as a four switch buck boost converter. And these three topologies are popular in the market for residential market. Then when you go for a commercial storage or the utility storage, you require the higher power level applications. For that, we do recommend symmetrical buck boost topology based on the three-level topology. And one of the reasons why we prefer to use a three-level topology is the power devices can use half the rated voltage of the system level. For example, in the solar industry, the storage of the 1100 volts DC bus is common till last couple of years. But now the industry is moving to 1500 volts DC bus for the utility solar and commercial solar. And 1500 volts DC bus required more than 1700 volts or two kilovolt device. But by using the three level symmetrical buck boost topology, you can able to use industry standard 1200 volt silicon carbide fats. This topology also reduces the losses and EMI, but it have a more complex control. Because it is a high power applications, this also may be a little bit more expensive. So this type of storage used in your different market segments for UPS applications in the data center, our commercial storage and the utility storage applications. On semi have uh, dedicated hybrid modules to configure this type of topology. And there is a plan to do a single uh, module with adding the, all the four switches into the application. But then there are some applications required in isolation from the high voltage DC to the low voltage DC. In those conditions, we require a isolated DC-DC converters and the two popular topologies for isolated DC-DC converters are a dual active bridge topology. And in this case, you have a primary side devices have a medium voltage fats, which are normally maybe 80 volts, 100 volts, or 150 volts based on the input voltage. Then the output voltage based on the inverter output voltage, either 120 volts or the 240 volts, you will have the DC bus voltage of like 200 volts or 400 volts. So you require a 650 volts, either silicon carbide fats needed. And most of these isolated topologies are operating at higher frequency in the range of 100 to 140 kilohertz applications. In some cases for like micro inverters, they may can go as high as maybe a couple of hundred kilohertz too. We are seeing the trend in the micro inverters to implement even GAN devices or silicon carbide devices. Then other topology is a resonant CLLC topology. This topology also have both primary side bridge circuit and the secondary side bridge circuit, but we have additional LC resonant components both on the primary side and secondary side. And both topologies will provide you soft switching and a wide voltage range operation. Both topologies can be used as a bidirectional converters. 
The main advantage of the dual active bridge compared to the resident CLLC is you don't need the resident capacitors in series with it, which are normally sometimes high peak currents need to be required. And so reliability sometimes case compromises. So the dual active bridge benefit on that part because it doesn't use any capacitors. So Walter, can you explain to me why it's better to have flat wire inductors in these kinds of applications? Yes, so it is well known that flat wire inductors are used because they offer a better DCR due to a more efficient use of the wire geometrical section. Basically, you have a better usage of the section compared to a round wire. However, there is another critical difference when it comes to high frequency applications. And to prove this, we took an example of conducting a test using two samples of a similar inductor. One is a standard flat wire part like the standard toroidal flat wire family from Wurt Electronic that was recently released. And the other one is a hand-wound round wire part. So both samples use the same core, same number of turns, and equivalent size wires to achieve a similar DCR. So we're comparing this time two components that have a similar flat wire. We want to check what's the advantage. So let's start from the values. The results show that there is a minimal difference in DCR, only 0.6 milliohms. However, there is a bigger difference in interwinding capacitance, which is significantly different. So 154 picofarad for a round wire compared to just 3 picofarad for the flat wire. So basically, when using round wire for windings, typically there are multiple layers involved leading to potential issues. So the image illustrates the multiple layers create a parasitic capacitance between wires, both within and between layers. And this results in complex parasitic capacitance, increasing the overall capacitance of the component. In contrast, using flat wires eliminates capacitance coupling between vertical layers, leaving only horizontal parasitic capacitance. As a consequence, the total capacitance is lower since it's seen just in series. For example, if we take an inductor with round wire and 200 micro Henry inductance, this has a self resonant frequency at about 1 MHz due to 154 picofarad parasitic capacitance. Meanwhile, an inductor with flat wire and 3 picofarad parasitic capacitance will resonate at 6.5 MHz. It's important because a higher resonance means a broader frequency spectrum where the component functions as an inductor. We all know that beyond the resonance point, it will act as a capacitive element. Therefore, a higher resonant frequency enables the inductor to operate efficiently at a higher switching frequencies. That is a common trend in solar inverter applications. So, Walter, earlier you mentioned it is better to use film capacitors instead of electrolytic. Can you talk about the comparison between these two capacitor technologies? Absolutely. So the main difference lies in the construction of a DC link capacitor compared to an electrolytic capacitor. A DC link film capacitor is based on different amount of layers of metallized polypropylene film. Only on one side of metallization is added to the polypropylene film, thus isolating each layer. Due to the nature of the material itself, these film caps have what we call self-healing properties. Due to the size of the metallized film surface and the isolation between each layer, basically the film cap is able to withstand high ripple current and it has a longer expected load life. And another important thing is that the resin inside the cap will provide self-extinguishing properties. So as we can imagine, in solar inverter applications where the DC link is probably located in a remote location and we don't want to do maintenance very often, it is better to have film capacitors because of the fact that there is less probability that they need to be replaced. So if you want to achieve the same capacitance using film capacitors and electrolytic capacitors, with electrolytic capacitors, we would need higher capacitance per volume. So we will need bigger volume, which will increase the size of our product. What is more, they will also have a higher ECR because they need to be connected in series. So our overall system will turn to be less efficient using electrolytic capacitor. This is why Brut Electronic recommends to use DC link capacitors for this application. And we have now a dedicated series of capacitors specifically designed for these applications. So Prasad, 
what kind of trends concerning integration are you seeing in the residential solar market? Yes, uh, what we are seeing is a consolidation of all-in-one bidirectional inverter. That means the customers are looking for an integration of MPPT DC-DC converter and then the solar inverter and the battery charger all into one big system in the power level of 8 kilowatts to 15 kilowatts. In addition to the integration, we are also seeing a lot of intelligence into the system, like a system monitoring, like a over current protection, over voltage protection, under voltage protection or short circuit protection. These are becoming more and more important. And the grid monitoring, like a blackouts or anti-I landing, and those things are also becoming important. Like outside of your house, you have a breaker system and the utility people came there and then shut off the breakers. But if your solar inverter is connected to that, then they can get a shock. So it need to monitor the grid and make sure there is no issues. Often it is less expensive to add the fewer components. For example, as we told that uh, if you want to add uh, an additional battery storage, you can add extra battery storage in this application. Then it is also easier to install because there's not more wiring and uh, because all the system is integrated one. Sometimes it may require a different applications. What we have AC coupling and DC coupling capability. Fantastic. Now, Prasad, how can engineers deal with galvanic isolation of the several modules used in an energy storage system. Yes. And when we're driving these power switches, we require a gate drivers. And these gate drivers are normally required a galvanic isolation from 3.3 kilowatt to 5.2 kilovolts. And there are various methods to implement for the galvanic isolated gate drivers. Some of them are gate drive transformers. And also you can use galvanic IC based gate drivers. In the IC gate driver based systems, you have a two different isolations. One is a capacitive isolation and then other one is a transformer based isolation. And uh, on semi have isolated gate drivers based on transformer isolated based gate driver ICs. So Walter, can you talk to me about the parasitic elements in the gate drivers? Yes, so what I can explain now is that if you have an isolated gate driver with a transformer, it is very important to consider the interwinding capacitance of the transformer itself. I will start with defining the common mode transient immunity that is typically called CMTI, and it is measured as the kilovolts by microsecond. It is an indication basically of the maximum rate of change of voltage dB over dt, which can be tolerated across the isolation barrier of the gate driver system before malfunction occurs. So if this happens, there will be a loss of control of the silicon carbide device, and we don't want that to happen. So the CMTI rating directly depends on the parasitic capacitance value across the isolation barrier. This is why it is important to have a transformer for the isolation of the gate driver, which features a very low interwinding capacitance. And this is why Brut Electronic released a specific family of auxiliary gate drive transformers, which have very low interwinding capacitance down to 6.8 picofarad. Therefore, helping the gate driver system to achieve CMTI rating above 100 kilovolts by microsecond. Besides the functional and reliability aspect, we can also improve the EMI performance with a lower interwinding capacitance because the higher the impedance seen by any common mode noise currents that try to couple between the low voltage and high voltage side. So keeping these noisy currents in the high voltage side, we can get away with a smaller EMC filter. So Prasad, can we also talk a bit about battery storage integration? What does that look like for OnSemi? Yeah, so the battery storage integration normally consists of AC couple versus DC couple. There are advantages and disadvantages of the, both the systems. And I will start with the AC coupled solar energy system. In case of this, what we have is a MPPT boost DC-DC converter and the inverter DCT AC in inverter are combined into a hybrid solar inverter. And then it also required additional battery storage system module where you have a charging and discharging the DC DC converter for the battery, but also it need to have additional AC to DC inverter. That means you have a two different AC to DC inverters are needed. So the overall system cost may be a little bit higher, 
but the flexibility of adding the storage battery in a separate box. And if you need to add the more storage, you can easily add to the whole system. That is the major advantage of it. But then it requires additional conversion steps, two inverters, and then you require a bidirectional charger plus inverter in the battery pack system. But with appropriate size and battery, we can add easily the additional DC to DC storage. While coming to the DC coupled solar energy storage, you have integrated system, one like a MPPT boost DC-DC converter and an inverter where you have a bidirectional inverter is implemented. And then you have also DC to DC converter, which have the capability for charging and discharging. So that means the power electronics is integrated into the one box, but that power box level is a multiple power levels. You can have like a 7.4 kilowatts or maybe a double the power level of up to 15 kilowatts, but then you can add extra storage easily without any problem too. And it enables the bidirectional DC to DC converters. So, Walter, how are the battery packs monitored? So, I can answer that by defining what are the main goals of a battery management system. So, a battery management system of BMS is an electronic system that manages a rechargeable battery with the goal to make it safe and reliable. So, basically, we want to protect the battery from operating outside of their operating area. We want to monitor the state of charge and state of health of the battery. We want also to calculate some other secondary data and report the data so that we can control the environment and if necessary, we can authenticate and balance the data itself. Typically, BMS system and the battery packs are monitored with every battery cell is monitored by a separate charging or monitoring unit. And the communication between these battery units and the BMS controller is done on a specific communication protocol. So between the components or the PCB connected in series, there will be a voltage difference between the control circuit and the charging circuits of the battery themselves. So there will be voltage differences and electromagnetic interference that can happen because of the difference of in voltage. So a transformer is needed in a BMS when there is a high voltage difference. A transformer that can be used to isolate the components from each other and also suppress EMI interference. So basically we need a transformer that also typically has common mode chokes integrated in the same component. If we look at a typical block diagram for a residential energy storage system, you will normally have an inverter and then you will have an isolated power supply which generates some battery protection. And then you will have a number of cell monitors depending on the type of stack that you're doing or on the individual application. There will be a simple isolation into the microcontroller and then normally there will be some kind of isolated communications. So in this slide, we can see that the magnetic associated to the isolated communication, therefore the transformer, is placed between the cell monitor and the microcontroller, creating the isolation that is required to make sure that there is no electromagnetic interference and that the voltage difference can create problems in the system itself. So Prasad, talk to me about the popular topology used in residential storage and solar inverters. Yeah, so in the residential applications, there are two different concepts. One is a microinverter and the other one is a string inverters. So in case of the microinverters, they have the whole inverter is in a low power range, like 800 watts uh, type of applications. While for the string inverters, you have a power level can be 7.4 kilowatts to 15 kilowatts. And then you have a front end is the boost module, which is what we call DC-DC converter, or in some cases, customers call it DC optimizer. Then you have a power inverter module where you use a H6.5 inverter is one of the example. Then it also have a DC to DC converter to charge and discharge the battery. So what type of passive components are used? Well, this is a good example to recap all the components that we have mentioned so far today. In regards of the DC link or DC bus connection, a DC film capacitor is strongly recommended because of the reliability. 
at the output of the inverter, a very important section would be the EMI filter. So filter inductors and capacitors together with over voltage protections are recommended. If we go to consider the several isolated gauge driver systems in this solar inverter topology, if a transformer is required, we can recommend the auxiliary gauge drive transformers. And last but not least, to monitor the battery packs with an isolated communication, we will need also the BMS transformers to isolate between the different voltages in the application. Yeah, on semi have uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs, IGBTs, and superjunction FETs, also the silicon FETs for the DC DC optimizers. Then I will start with uh, on semi have a silicon carbide MOSFETs mainly targeting residential inverter applications. They are focused on 650 volts uh, devices. On semi have M2 product line, which are in production from last two to three years. Then developing the next generation M3S 650 volts technology targeting for residential inverters like a 12 milliohms 650 volts is very popular part in that market. Then similarly for DC to DC optimizers, on semi have uh, medium voltage FETs from uh, 80 volts to 100 volts and 150 volts. So these are all good on semi products for the DC DC applications. Specifically, the power trench T10 silicon MOSFETs are good for DC to DC optimizers, while for inverter stage, Elite 6 silicon carbide FETs are very popular. But if customers are looking for a lower cost option, and especially we do see in Asia market, a lot of customers are using 650 volts IGBTs and on semi have FS4 IGBTs to target these applications. In micro inverter applications, some customers use also superjunction FETs in the microinverter applications. On semi do have uh, silicon carbide diodes or silicon diodes with the different technologies covering the 650 volts and 1200 volts. Then the last one, on semi also have a silicon carbide modules targeting for the higher power level like a commercial utility inverters, commercial storage or utility storage applications with the voltage ranges from 650 volts to 1200 volts releasing the new 2 kV devices to target the 1500 volts DC bus utility storage applications. So, Walter, can you give me some more in-depth details about this portfolio? Right, so I can highlight that Virtual Electronic offers a specific portfolio of high current inductors distinguished between uh, WEHCFT and WEHCF, so both through edge all or SMD components. We have a very wide portfolio of common mode choke, ferrite beads, ESD, and surge protection devices. In regards to the power factor correction, we can offer the toroidal PFC choke, but we also have non-toroidal PFC inductors. To complete with your application, we can also offer several types of capacitors, not only the film capacitors, but also electrolytic and MLCC. I would also highlight the fact that we can offer current sense transformer, which is another important component that can be used in solar inverter application. And of course, it is always good to remind that Virtual Electronic also offer quartz crystals and oscillators and electromechanic components, such as high current connectors that come with the commercial name of red cube connectors. Okay, well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Walter. Thank you so much, Amelia, for having me. And thank you for joining me, Prasad. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.